Let's get our Bibles out. Um, you can start turning to Exodus chapter 19. We've been talking about um, how that God has used the nation of Israel as a, well, he calls Israel his son collectively, and how he uses Israel as a means, a teaching tool for us, that how God has interacted with that nation down through history, and that we are to learn uh, lessons from Israel's history. I want to talk about a little bit about um, our well, our class title today is the taste of victory and prosperity. You know, some of the lessons that. Well, let me ask you guys this: What are some of the lessons that God has taken Israel through um, that we've talked about in the last couple of weeks or so? What are some of those lessons? What are the things that uh, He was teaching them? What were they learning? Okay. All right, but okay, trust. But what are the specific lessons? What experiences did he take them through to learn these lessons? Right? He isn't just instructing them. He's he's telling them, but then he takes them through experiences. Right? What was the first major experience that God has taken the descendants of Abraham through um, to teach them lessons? Important lessons, Ken. Okay, yeah, good, Isaac. Uh, yes, he took them. He he had them persecuted, right? They, uh, in fact, Isaac was persecuted from almost the moment he was born by um, his brother and uh, uh, Ishmael. But they were also persecuted in in as they were adults. Isaac was, and Jacob was, and then uh, of course they went down to Egypt where they became slaves. All their, all, you know, uh, they had become a lot of people by that time, and they became slaves in Egypt. And all right, so that was an experience. What was God teaching them through that experience? Because see, before, before you answer that, God promised Abraham all these wonderful things, right? That He was going to make of him a great nation. That He was going to uh, give him this everlasting inheritance and all this stuff, but. When he starts fulfilling the promise, yes, he does produce a child supernaturally, and then, you know, this this begins to multiply. But the very first lesson is not something that you would c consider a blessing. It's persecution, right? Let me ask you this: Was that important for 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 them to be persecuted right off the bat? To be put through hardship and to be, you know, mistreated and all that right off the bat. It was important. Do you think it's important for us to face some persecution and trouble and injustice? Yeah, in fact, the New Testament talks about that. How that trials and tribulation produce endurance and patience and things like that, right? Okay, so what was the lesson? What lesson should... Um, should the Israelites take from all that persecution that they endured? Injustice. What it feels like, right? What it feels like to be on the receiving end of injustice. It's important to know that because when God then brought them out, they got to, they got to see what it feels like to be rescued from that. Right? You know, somebody who is Somebody who grows up, you know, we might call it uh, with a silver spoon in their mouth. You've heard that expression, right? They're born with a silver spoon in their mouth. It means, you know, they're, they're born into an affluent family. They've got everything they need. You know, uh, their, their parents take care of everything. And then when they grow up, you know, they, their parents put them through the best colleges. Um, you know, they get the best jobs and, and all that kind of stuff. And it seems like they've got everything going for them. But then you've got people who seem like everything is against them. From the moment they're born, everything seems to be against them. And that's how God brought, put, that's the position God put the children of Israel in from the very beginning. Not the silver spoon in the mouth thing. You know, Abraham is God's, is God's man. And God is promising to make of him a great nation and do all these wonderful things. But the very first thing he does is he puts him in this awful position. He puts his, his descendants in this awful position from the birth of Isaac all the way until Moses came along, 400 years, they were in this position 
of being persecuted. And then towards the end, the last 200 years of it roughly, they're slaves in Egypt. And then God comes and he delivers them in this miraculous way. And he punishes their, their persecutors. He defeats their persecutors and basically almost wipes them out. Now, what, what is God showing in that? Actually, I think Isaac has what I'm looking for. What, what? Yes. Now, that was a taste of God's justice, right? Destroying the persecutors and freeing the slaves. That was God's justice in that. All right. He, he, God allowed their persecution to go on for quite some time because he wanted them to really understand um, what that injustice was like. And then he came and he delivered them. He taught them not only who he was, what a powerful and awesome God he was, but he also taught them what true justice is. That is, those who persecute others, those who mistreat others, are going to be punished ultimately. It might take a long time, but in the end, justice is going to prevail. So they learned that this God who was delivering them out of Egypt was a just God, right? They learned, they had learned what being on the receiving end of injustice is like, and now they see justice being executed by God when he delivered them out of Egypt. And what's the first thing God does then? He gives them his law. When he, when he brought them out of Egypt, he brought them to Mount Sinai. It took them seven weeks to go from deliverance out of Egypt on that Passover day it took them seven weeks to get from there to the foot of Mount Sinai. And then on the 50th day, which we call Pentecost, is when God delivered the law to Moses. All right, that's what we, we celebrate Pentecost. It's, it was that seven week period between Passover and Pentecost that they were traveling, that they left Egypt and they got out into the desert there at the foot of Mount Sinai. Now God delivers his law. He delivered his law within a certain context. The context was they had just suffered all this time of injustice. They had just been delivered and God had ex executed his justice on the Egyptians. And then immediately after that, God says, now here's my law. This is what justice is like, all right? I, you, I just demonstrated it by punishing the Egyptians and freeing you and now I want to give you my law. And he gives them all these regulations, the Ten Commandments, all that kind of stuff in that law. And then, um, then we have uh, Joshua at, at, after the uh, 40 years of wandering in the wilderness because of their rebellion, which we talked about last time. Then Joshua is going to take them into the land. By the way, last time I told you guys that um, the last chapters of Deuteronomy are important. Has anybody uh, taken the time to read through some of that? Actually, the whole, the whole book of Deuteronomy, do you know what Deuteronomy means, that word? Does anybody know what the word Deuteronomy means? Nobody knows? It means second law. Second law. And why is it called second law? Because the entire book of Deuteronomy is a speech that Moses gave to the children of Israel at the end of the 40 years when they're about he's about to hand over the leadership to Joshua after they'd wandered in the wilderness for those 40 years the entire book of Deuteronomy is Moses giving recounting what had happened in the past telling them to learn these important lessons from their history not only from being persecuted for really for uh, all that time in Egypt but God's deliverance out of Egypt, God giving them his law, what they learned from the fact that they rebelled against God when, he, when they sent the spies in, how God punished them during those 40 years and he wiped out that whole generation and now they're all dead. And here are the children of the people who came out of Egypt. The children, and they've grown up now. The next generation and Moses is handing over the baton if you will to Joshua to take the children of Israel into the land so that God can now resume 
fulfilling the promises that he made all the way back to Abraham, right? That's, yes. Were you saying something? Oh, I thought I heard somebody say something. All right. Now, as part of that, the whole book of Deuteronomy is Moses recounting all that history, the important lessons they should have learned from that history, and warning them about the fact that they're about to cross over Jordan, the River Jordan, to go into the land led by Joshua. Moses is going to die. He's, God said, you can't go into the land, Moses. So he's giving his last speech to the children of Israel, and he's urging them not to make the same mistakes that they made in the past. And uh, the book of Deuteronomy, of all the books of Moses, I think Deuteronomy is quoted in the New Testament more than any other because it's because of those important lessons that were there for the children of Israel. Now, um, what I want to what I want to do right now is I want to look at um, this concept of being the chosen people. One of the things one of the things that Moses warned Israel about as they're about to go into the promised land and now God is about to begin to fulfill his promises of victory over their enemies, his promises of prosperity, them inheriting the land, that, this land that he told them was a land flowing with milk and honey, meaning it, ha it would have uh, abundant crops and so forth. He's about to start prospering them greater than all the other nations around them as a people when he gives them this land. But there's some warnings because, see, just like, just like you can have the wrong reaction to being oppressed. What's the wrong reaction to being oppressed and being put into slavery? What's the wrong reaction to that? Anger, bitterness, things like that, right? You, you can have the wrong reaction to prosperity as well. Isn't that right? What's the wrong reaction to prosperity? Yeah. Think you're better than everybody. Right? Isn't that right? All right. Let's look at what Moses said. Go to Exodus chapter 19. Now, this statement here in Exodus is, is not at the end of that uh, 40 years, but it ties in with some things that, that uh, Moses says at the end. So I want to I point this one out first. Exodus chapter 19, verse 3. <clears throat> now, this is 40 years earlier when, when they were at Mount Sinai after God had brought them out of Egypt. Um, it says, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey the voice, my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Now, is God saying that he wanted this nation to be special? Right? The chosen people. Chosen by God. To pour out his blessings upon. But also to punish when they're out of line. He chose them to deal with them in this very close relationship between them as a people and God as their God. A relationship that he didn't have with any of the other nations of the earth. Those other nations didn't know this God. Now that doesn't mean God didn't interact in certain ways with the other peoples of the earth. He, he did. I mean look what he did at the Tower of Babel, right? I mean, he interacted from time to time, but he didn't have this close relationship where he's, he's taken this one nation aside and he's now teaching them these important things about who he is as a God and what it means to be the people of God and all these things. So he's taking them through these sequence of, or sequence of lessons. But the thing I want you to notice here is how he talked about delivering them um, by bearing them on eagle's wings. That's sort of a metaphorical way of talking about how he brought them out of Egypt. Like, you know, uh, eagles soar high in the sky, right? They're powerful birds. And they soar, they're the highest flying birds. They soar very, very high. And they can cover enormous distances in a very short period of time. 
And so God likens him bringing them out of Egypt through the Red Sea and all the stuff that he did to picking them up and carrying them like an eagle. You know, an eagle um, is a bird of prey. An eagle will spot, they have an extremely good vision. And they will spot, you know, a rabbit or something like that from very high altitudes. And then they will go into a nosedive. And they'll swoop down, reach out those talons, and grab that animal from behind. It doesn't see them coming. It just grabs them from behind, and away they go. They soar back up high and carry it off someplace to their nest. And so God likens his delivering Israel out of Egypt to an eagle swooping down and grabbing this nation out of Egypt and carrying them off airborne <laughs> to himself and delivering them out of that slavery. And what's cool about that is in Revelation, when, when God is talking about his people in the last days and how he's going to preserve them, he uses exactly the same metaphor in Revelation chapter 12. How he is going to give the woman the wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place that God has prepared with, that he would feed her there for that last three and a half years of tribulation and, and uh, the book of Micah says that God has is going to do for his people in the last days his faithful ones in the last days the same thing he did when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt but we got to make sure we're some of those faithful ones, all right? Because not all people who call themselves Christians are going to um, have that benefit in the last days. All right, so look what he says in verse 6. He says, you shall be um, to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. Now, what is a priest? What does a priest do? Look, think of uh, in the Old Testament. What did the priests do? Sorry, what? Okay, for the people, right? They were sort of a go-between between between the common people and God. They handled the things of God. They were judges. The priesthood was the court system back in those days. If people had an issue, they had to bring it to the priests. And the priests are the ones who would officiate. In other words, what they did is they handled God's law. God gave the law to Israel as a legal system, and the priests were in charge of making sure everything was handled according to the law. All right, so they officiated. They had a, a role of authority over the people to make sure that, that uh, you know, if there was a dispute between people, uh, they, didn't, they didn't, you know, uh, call the police or something like that. I mean, they... They had to bring it to the temple, to the priests, and the priests would, uh, they were sort of like the Supreme Court of the nation of Israel. They had to, they, they were the arbiters, and whatever they said, you know, they would listen to a case, and then they would go to God's law, and they would say, okay, well, the law says this and this, so therefore they'll rule in the favor of this party or that party, things like that. Even, even up if somebody had leprosy, they were, um, they were to be, barred from the camp so that it would because it was contagious right when they thought they were cured or well from that they had to go to the priest and the priest had to examine them and there were very strict guidelines in the law as to what had to happen in order for them to be allowed to come back into the camp so you can see how uh, the priests were that buffer between the people and God and what he says here is he wants this nation to become a kingdom of priests isn't that interesting a kingdom of priests a holy nation holy set apart now he brought them through a process where only one tribe the tribe of Levi were priests isn't that right during the entire time of the Old Testament but his ultimate goal is to have a kingdom of priests and to be a holy nation now, what's interesting about this, when God is telling Israel this, when he brings them out of Egypt, this is his ultimate goal for this nation. We know that they have failed miserably in that, right? Did you know that the New Testament uses exactly the same language in reference to us? That is, God is training us up to be this kingdom of priests, 
to be this holy nation. We have been grafted in, if we're not Jews, most of us here are not Jewish, um, we have been grafted in, we've become part of Abraham's seed, but God is still, his, his, his initial goal that he laid out for Israel at Mount Sinai, and this is right after he brought them out of Egypt, his initial goal is still his goal. Where they failed, people were cut off. Others of us now in the New Testament times have been grafted in. But ultimately his goal is still the same. It is that, look at verse 6. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests. Did you know that when, when Jesus is preaching the gospel of the kingdom, he's still preaching this same goal, this same message that uh, God said for Israel when he first brought them out. The goal was to establish God's kingdom on the earth. And he started by bringing this nation out. And then all of history is all pointing to this kingdom that God intends to set up on the earth. And what he's doing is he's starting with this group of people and he's training them and he's, and he is, um, what's the word? Um, he's rooting out <laughs> those who are not fit from his, from that. Okay. Now, um, I want you, before we go to the New Testament, I want you to look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. <clears throat> write down, if you, if you have a pen and paper, before you go there, I want you to write down these two phrases. A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You got that? A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Yes, it'll be on the test. <laughs> Deuter now go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Now this is at the end of the 40 years. That was at the beginning of the 40 years uh, of uh, wandering in the wilderness till that whole nation or that whole generation died off and only their children were left. And now we're at the end of that in Deuteronomy um, chapter 7 verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess, and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, so the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. But this you shall deal, uh, but thus you shall deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their sacred pillars and cut down their wooden images and burn their carved images with fire. Now why? Look at the next verse. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you. And I want you to underline those words, chosen you. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself. A special treasure, underline special treasure. Above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you. Underline the words, choose you. This is very important. This is where the concept of the chosen people comes from. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath that he swore to your fathers, that is to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, I want you to remember, please, these phrases. A holy nation, a kingdom of priests, a chosen people, a special treasure, This is how God is characterizing this group of people as a group, right? His own chosen people. And whenever we read the New Testament and you see the Apostle Paul using terms like chosen, elect, election, 
He's talking about this. He's talking about how God chose a people out from among all the people of the earth to be his special people, his treasure, his holy nation, his kingdom of priests. And the New Testament is not talking about some different concept. It's talking about exactly the same thing because what God started back there when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he is still continuing in the New Testament. Yes, he has cut off most of the people that descended from them. And yes, he has grafted in Gentiles into that holy people, that special treasure, that kingdom of priests. Yes, he's done that. So it's not just a genetic thing now. But the class of people, the group of people, is the same group of people. Now, what, what that should tell you is that the New Testament is not something that is completely separate from the Old Testament. That is, God, there's a teaching that God, you know, he chose the children of Israel to do this thing, and he had these plans for them and all that, and then they screwed up. And so God has just kind of put all that aside, and now he's doing something entirely different with the Gentiles. And the destiny now of this group that, you know, we're part of has nothing to do with the destiny of that original group. Nonsense. It's not true. What God did there, what he started there, he is still working on. He's still doing it. He's still fulfilling the promises that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's just that the majority of the people who are descended from them have turned their back on God. And so God has sent them into exile. And he has, he has grafted us into that and allowed us to be part of that. All right? Not because we're special, but because he has mercy on us and he's allowing us to share in the promises and the covenants that he made with that special people and we're part of it now even though we're not physically descended from Abraham we're part of it he's allowing us to be part of that as well but ultimately he's going to bring it all to a conclusion with those people even the ones who are in exile he's going to bring them back all right <clears throat> now what I want you to do is go over to first Peter I want to prove this to you from the New Testament um, 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, 1 and 2 Peter. Peter was a Jew, was he not? Yes. All the apostles were Jews. Peter was a Jew. The early Christian churches were started as Jewish congregations. That is, when the majority of Israel rejected Christ, a, a remnant of Israel received Christ, and they became the early church in Jerusalem. They were Jewish, all right? And God was continuing to fulfill his word just like he did, uh, his promises to Abraham, just like he did throughout the Old Testament. He hasn't stopped. Just because it's Old and New Testament doesn't mean God stopped doing what he was doing and started something new, all right? So... Um, they were Jew. The early church was Jewish, and then we see, if you read the book of Acts and the epistles, that Gentiles are being brought in and allowed to become partakers of the covenants that God made with Israel. If, if you don't believe that, read Ephesians chapter 2. The whole chapter is about that. Okay? Now, uh, look what Peter says. First and second Peter are interesting because Peter, as a Jewish apostle, he writes first Peter to his Jewish Christian brothers his faithful Jewish Christian brothers, those who did not abandon Christ when he came. All right, They embraced Christ when he came. He writes 1 Peter to his Jewish brothers. He writes 2 Peter to the Gentiles that had been grafted in. All right, So keep that distinction in mind. 1 Peter was to Christians, but they were Jewish Christians. 2 Peter is to Christians, but who are Gentile Christians. But we've all been gathered together into one body. All right, to where there is no longer uh, a distinction in how God is going to fulfill his promises by genetics. Okay? It's, it's, uh, we're all one body in Christ. But anyway, in 1 Peter, I want you to notice how the Apostle Peter, when he's talking to his Jewish brothers, what he, how he quotes these passages that we just read from Exodus and from Deuteronomy. And he applies them to the, to the Christian churches. All right? 
So look what he says in uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. Now notice this, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture. And this is a quote from Isaiah 28. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient. Now, what is he talking about? He's, he's, he's classifying the Jews into two classes. You who believe and those who are disobedient. And the difference between them is, is how some of them embraced Christ as the Messiah and the majority of them rejected Christ as the Messiah. And that's, that's the distinction between those two, okay? Therefore, to you who believe, he, that is Christ, is precious. But to those who are disobedient, and now he quotes Psalm 118, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And... He quotes Isaiah 8 here, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. So the stone that Isaiah and, and David talked about is Christ. Just like the rock, Peter, uh, um, um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, that that rock that followed them through the wilderness was Christ. So the, Isaiah talks about this stone that's going to be both a foundation and at the same time a stumbling stone. He's saying it's a foundation stone for those of you who believe that Christ is precious. It's a stumbling stone for those of you who disbelieve. That's what he's saying, and he's quoting these passages. Then he says, uh, in, in part of verse 8, he says, They stumble, being disobedient to the word, to which they also were appointed. But you, now when he says you, he's talking about the remnant that embraced Christ, those who believed he was precious. It says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Now, what is he doing? He's grabbing all these phrases that Moses used for the children of Israel when God brought them out of Egypt. And he's applying them only to the remnant that believe. Which means the re those who stumbled at the stumbling stone, this doesn't apply to them. See, they're not part of that holy nation. They're not, they're not part of that holy priesthood. They're not part of that special treasure of God because they have, have uh, shown themselves not to be worthy of that, and they've been cut off from that. Um, verse 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And there he's quoting from Hosea 1, 9, and 10. If you want to know what that's about, go back and read that passage. All right, uh, beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from flesh. All right, we're not going to get into all that. You see, how, you see how he takes all these titles that God gave Israel when he brought them out, of, when he delivered them out of Egypt. He gave them all these titles. Of, and they all point to what his ultimate goal is for this people. And he's saying that it's, this applies to the remnant of Israel that embraced Christ. It doesn't apply to the rest who rejected him. All right? Okay. Now, let's go to... Um, let's look at one of the other important lessons. I told you before that Deuteronomy... The book of Deuteronomy is simply a record of Moses' last words to the children of Israel at the end of the 40 years, and he's simply reiterating all that has happened. He's telling them all that has happened, all the lessons that they should have learned, repeating some of the important things, warning them about the dangers of prosperity because they're about to go in the land, and God's about to fulfill a lot of the promises that he gave. And there are dangers in prosperity. Right? Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'm going to read verses... Well, I'm going to read, actually, um, all of chapter 8. 
every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord your God swore to your fathers. And you shall remember the Lord your God led, led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you. Remember how I talked about how that God was testing the nation of Israel when he brought them to the edge of the promised land? He was testing them. All right, he says so right here. To humble you and to test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Is he teaching them lessons? Even the manna. Even the fact that he brought them out into the wilderness where there is no food. This enormous group of people, he brought them out into the wilderness to cross a desert where there's no food and there's no water. They had no way of sustaining themselves. There were lessons in that. And what was the lesson? You are entirely dependent on God. You are absolutely dependent on God. And if God says, you know what, I'm mad at these people, I'm not going to send them any food, guess what, you're going to starve to death. Or you're not going to have any water. You ever hear the expression, don't bite the hand that feeds you? You heard that? All right. Part of the lesson was, God is the hand that is feeding you. Don't you think it's important not to be offensive to God? Right? Look how powerful he is. Look what he can do. Look what he's promised to do. And then you dare to bite the hand that feeds you? You dare to say, let's stone Moses and pick a new leader to take us back to Egypt. Back to slavery. You know, yes, Walter, you have something to say? I see this also here as a depiction of the Great Tribulation that what he's going to do with the church as a whole, I think, because it's going to be the remnant that are the faithful ones, and there are going to be those that probably aren't as much. It says to humble you and to test you, and that's exactly what's going to happen in tribulation. They're going to be humbled and tested. They're going to be refined with fire. Yeah. Well, not only that, I mean, uh, Hebrews, Hebrews chapters 3 and 4 talk about this, how that, that what Israel faced when God brought them to the, the, you know, the entrance to the promised land to see if they would be faithful and then God would take them in or if they would turn away from God and he would exclude them from the promised land. Hebrews says that that's going to happen again for us. Whether or not we're going to pass the test and be taken into the land, the kingdom of God, or whether in the end times we're going to fail the test because we forsake God, and then we're going to be destroyed. There's a test coming. That's the final exam. It's coming for us. All right? All right, so look at verse 4. He says, Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. Now, that's, that's something that was supernatural right there. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Now remember, he, when he brought them out, he said, Israel is my son, my firstborn son. Right? So he's, he's dealing, them, dealing with them as a class of people here. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you to a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. It sounds like a great place. And it was. A land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. In other words, there's a lot of resources there. Right? Raw materials or resources. Metals and things like that. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. That's a commandment. When God starts prospering you, you are commanded. They were commanded to bless God for the prosperity that they had. But then look what he says in verse 11. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you 
through that great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, that, you, you, that he might test you, and do you good in the end. Then you say in your heart, my power and my might of my hand have gained me this wealth. There's the danger, right there. Forget your source. And you, remember, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for he it is who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. Then it shall be if you, if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish as the nations which the Lord destroys before you, so you shall perish because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go in to dispossess nations greater than mightier than yourselves, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the descendants of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Therefore understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you. Please underline that. He who goes over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you, so you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said to you. Wow. Do you see what he's telling them here? He's, he's pointing them back to what has happened so far. And he's showing them, look, God has brought you now from Egypt all the way here to this point, 40 years later, and even during that period of time when he was punishing your fathers, the previous generation, allowing them to die in the wilderness, he provided bread, he provided water. Was it for the benefit of those whom God had rejected? No, it was for the benefit of the children. Why was God giving them water and out of the rock and giving them food every day? It wasn't for their parents. God had already said, I'm done with them. It was for the children. Until they grew up to the point where God said, I'm going to bring you into the land. And he's telling them, look, he's telling the next generation, look at all God has done. Now, your parents were tested in this way, and they failed. Now you are going into the land, but you're going to be tested in a different way. That is, how are you going to handle the prosperity and the victory that God gives you? Are you going to forget about God when you're prosperous? Well, you know the history of Israel. That's exactly what happened. Isn't that right? That's exactly what happened. It's happened over and over again. God had to beat up on them several times and pick the next generation after that and the next generation after that and keep pointing them back to the lessons that they should have learned from their history. I mean, this is what we're going to see throughout the Old Testament as God is dealing with these people. All right, I want you to go to um, Joshua chapter 1. <clears throat> Verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from, this, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea, that was the Mediterranean, toward the going down of the sun, the west, obviously, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Again, that's the, what, what uh, is being quoted in Hebrews, applying the same thing. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. 
This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Is this conditional? Is prosperity and success conditional? Yes. To what? Obedience. Obedience to the law. Faithfulness to God and to his law. Now, that statement is to Israel, when God brought them into the land. It's not a statement you can just grab out of context and say, you know, God has to prosper me, um, you know, and make me very wealthy because I'm going to obey his commandments. It, everything has a context. All right? We've got to keep that in mind. Now, if you continue reading Joshua, which we're not, <clears throat> if you continue reading Joshua, what you find is that the very first thing they did, at, well, look, a couple of things they did. We'll, let me point these out. Number one, they crossed over the Jordan River. You know what God did? He parted the water of the Jordan River just like he parted the Red Sea when they came out of Egypt. He parted. Joshua now holds his staff. Actually, what he did is he told the priests to pick up the Ark of the Covenant and start walking. And the rest of you follow them. And so they start walking. And they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant. It's a big box, right? And they got these big poles sticking out. And they got, you know, one guy in the back or a couple of guys in the back and a couple of guys in the front and are hauling this thing. And they step into the water of the Jordan River. You know, God didn't part the water, dry it all up for them and say, okay, now go across. It's not what he did. He said, start going. And he didn't part the river. Start going. Pick it up and go. So the priests pick it up and they go and they're going down into the water. And when their feet hit the water, this, the river parted. Requires faith, doesn't it? Doesn't that require faith? It'd be easy to walk through after God has parted it and you sit there a while and make sure that the water's not going to come that down on top of you while you're under there. Right? That would be, you know, the typical response. But that's not how God works. You have to step out first. And then as you obey, then God fulfills his promises. And you have to do it in a way that, I mean, here's all these people following them. I mean, there's no place to go if the water doesn't part. <laughs> you know? It was the same at the Red Sea, wasn't it? Here they are at the Red Sea, you know, when they left Egypt, and they got their backs up against the sea, and Pharaoh's army's coming down on them. They got no place to go. And it was until they were in that situation where they were being absolutely threatened. Their lives were threatened and they thought they were going to die, that then God parted the Red Sea and sent them through. This is the way God operates. All right, you need to know that. Don't expect God to open all the doors ahead of you for what he's called you to do and show you how everything is going to work out in the end. Don't expect that. Expect him to just tell you to do this one thing. And you say, that is stupid. Right? That's impossible. Yeah, it's impossible. That's the point. Because God is going to do what he says he's going to do after you start moving forward and what he told you to do. After you take the risk. Then he's going to start opening the doors. Okay? Yeah, Walter? It's like when Peter was in the boat and just walking on the water and just said, come on. Yeah. That's, this is how... This is, yeah. The saying is, if you want to walk on the water, you better get out of the boat. Yeah. There's a book by that title, actually. Now, so that's what happened. The, the, the Jordan River parted, they went through. And you know what God told them to do if you read the first chapters of Joshua? He said, look, after they all got on the other side, and the water still parted, he says, he says to them, I want you to take one, one of the leaders from each of the 12 tribes, and I want them to go back down into the bottom of the river, riverbed, and I want them to pick up 12 big stones that they can carry out there, right? So each one of these guys, representing each of the 12 tribes, he carries this big, giant stone, and he brings it across the Jordan River, and then, you know, the dry riverbed, up to the other bank of the river, and then the God closed the river, the river again. And then he says, now I want you to build an altar with these 12 stones. Just a pile of 12 big rocks. And, he, and why, why put those rocks there? Because they came out of the bottom of the river. See, river stones are smooth, aren't they? You ever seen river, river rocks? They're round and smooth. Land rocks are jagged and, and all that. These were river rocks. They were big, round boulders. And God says, I want you to pile these up on the side of the Jordan River. And now, in, in, in years to come, because now they're in the promised land, 
in years to come, when your children come and say, hey, Dad, what does this big pile of rocks mean? You're to tell them the story of how God parted the, the, uh, the river, Jordan, and brought you across. And these are memorial stones to remind your children about what God has done and how he brought us into the land and so forth, right? So then what's the next thing that happens? They keep the Passover because it was Passover time. It's exactly 40 years after that Passover when they left Egypt. And then what happens? God commands them to go and conquer the first city, Jericho. Big city, big walls. And we got a little band of Israelites with, you know, maybe a couple of bows and arrows and a couple of swords, and uh, that's pretty much it. I mean, they don't have tanks and, and, you know, artillery or anything like that. They've got, there's a band of guys with, you know, a few hand tools. And so God tells them he's going to conquer the city. How are they going to get in? Well, you know, he tells them to go around the city, marching around the city with the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and they're going to go around the city once on the first day and blow their trumpet. And then they're supposed to go around the city once on the second day. The ones on the third day. And, and the people in the city are up on the walls and they're looking at it and they're laughing at this. You know, these guys, they got nothing. You know, they got absolutely nothing. They're going to conquer our city with these big walls. And so, we, you know the story. On the seventh day, he said, go around the city seven times. And then at the end of that, you blow the trumpets. And what happened? The vibration, the sonic vibration from all these trumpets caused the walls to crumble, right? No. No, because trumpets don't do that. But God took his finger and went like that to the wall of Jericho. And the whole thing collapsed. And they went and conquered the city. Now, could they have done that without God? No. Are there lessons to learn from that? Yeah. God said he was going to go before them. He said he was going to conquer their enemies. They just had to obey. And God did it. He brought down the walls of Jericho. Now, they had a great celebration. There they are. They're in the land. God is fulfilling his promises. They're seeing God's power working in the land, not just to get them out of Egypt, but now working to conquer the land, as he said. So the next city is Ai. And, God's, and you know, God says, you're going to go in and conquer the, the next city. But what he had told them, something very important, when, when they had conquered Jericho, he told them he didn't want them taking any of the stuff. Look at Joshua chapter 6. <clears throat> oh, sorry, 7. This is right after they conquered Jericho, or, you know, as they're celebrating. He sa it says, but the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed thing, things. That is, they weren't supposed to take the stuff. For Achan, the son of uh, Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now look, one guy ruined it for the whole group. That's what this passage is teaching us. One guy ruined it. Verse 2, now Joshua sent men uh, from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Avon and so forth. We're not going to read, I'll tell you the story because it's a lot faster. They go to conquer the next city because God is with them, supposedly, now. They saw that God was with them. They go to conquer the next city, and what happens? They get their butts kicked. And Joshua, he's like, what happened? What happened? <laughs> right? What happened, God? You said you were with us and all that. Look at verse 6. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord uh, until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. <laughs> He's whining just like the children of Israel were whining all through the wilderness. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then... What will you do for, you, for your great name? <laughs> He's worried about how God's going to handle the situation. 
And so what does God say? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things, and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel, notice that, therefore, underline that, therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction, Neither, under, you ne definitely need to underline this. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed thing from among you. Wait a minute. Didn't he say in Joshua chapter 1, I will be with you, I will never leave you nor forsake you? That's great. And now he forsook them. And he's, I'm not going to be with you anymore. You're on your own. We'll see how you do on your own. You got a choice. You either root out the sin, or I'm not going to be with you anymore. Your choice. Hmm. That was a hard choice. <laughs> if they don't root out the sin, what's going to happen? They got no supplies. They're, they're outnumbered. If God's not with them, they're going to be destroyed. Period. They're in the land now. They're behind enemy lines. <laughs> they got no supplies. They need God more than that, more than ever. Just as much as they needed him in the wilderness, they need him now. Get rid of the sin, and then I'll be with you, he says. So what did they do? They took the guy who did this, the guy who transgressed and took the stuff and hid it. They took him and they destroyed him. They killed him. God said that's a death penalty for that guy. And you root the sin out and then God will be with you. What I want you to get from this is how important it is to God that his people collectively as a whole are holy and devoted to him and his covenants and fully dependent on him. It's very important that we are fully dependent on him. He's not going to do anything great with his people as a covenant people unless they are absolutely dependent on him. They have to be walking by faith. Isn't that right? Isn't, isn't that what walking by faith is? You're trusting God, but you're not just trusting him. You're not just, you're not just trusting him that, you know, well, the sun's going to rise tomorrow. You're trusting him for your very existence. You're trusting him for your food. If he doesn't keep his promise, you're going to die. That's the kind of faith God wants. And that's the kind of faith that God is going to produce in us in the end times. And this is why the end times are going to be so hard and so severe. Because they are a final exam for God's people, for God's churches. They're the final exam. And the question is, are we going to fail or are we going to pass? Because if you fail, you're destroyed. If you pass, you get to go into the promised land, the kingdom of God, and have the inheritance and immortality. Otherwise, this life is all you have. Enjoy it while you got it, because there ain't no more. You guys get that? All right, I think those are pretty important lessons to learn. All right. That's it, unless you have questions. Yes, question. Yeah. Yes, it's exactly the same thing. It's exactly because it a little bit corrupts, and when you see, just like the children of Israel were in a very precarious situation, there, God is going to repeat a very similar situation in the end times, and it's going to be very important for us if we want God's presence with us that it's going to we're not going to be able to tolerate sin. Period. All right, not at all. Not among us. Not if we want God's presence among us. Because in the last days, we're going to be absolutely dependent on him. Absolutely dependent on him. T t for survival. Okay? Yes? Yeah, it's the same thing with the warning of the local congregation of the church. If there's sin in that church, you have to purge it. Yeah. That's what somebody else just said. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Okay.